I was trying to think of a stinger. We don't even need that, do we? Okay. We can, but it's not to you. Okay. Well, let's not do it. Welcome to Panelism, the podcast where we talk about comics and graphic novels worth having on your shelf, and a few other things that we will get to in a minute. Uh, I am Todd A. I'm Taylor Trask. Hello, Taylor. Well, there's other <laughs> things, and let's let's just talk about those right out you of the gate. You should just jump. Yeah, what's new? Jump in. Well, so 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 yes, we have traditionally <laughs> been the podcast about the comics and graphic novels worth having on your shelf, and we still are. Like, let's not let's just make that yeah, clear. Yeah. But, 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 we've been talking for a while about the fact that we used to do uh, a lot of other sort of kinds of topics and things that are, you know, geek adjacent, let's just say, um, and, and been kind of missing that format, but we didn't want to give up the books because a lot of you guys like the books and we oh, like the books and, yeah, yeah. you know, but, and, yeah, exactly. So, so we, we're going to have our cake and eat it too. And if you're looking at this uh, or you're listening to this rather, you may have noticed in the feed this is titled Panelism Watching, colon, The Watchman. And, uh, or rather, HBO's Watchman, I think, probably more specifically, since we haven't put it out yet. We're still recording. Um, but no, it's we're going to be doing a, a, a sub-feed moving forward of different kinds of episodes. So as you're following along, if there's a particular kind of episode you don't want to listen to, you can skip it. Um, taking this model kind of from the, the, the podcasts that have done it very well, like last podcast on the left, Joe Rogan to some extent. You know, it's just it, we're taking the panelism feed and making it richer so you're listening to the the panelism watching episodes we're also going to be doing panelism one shots where we talk about random just you know things that have popped up from time to time the books are going into the panelism book club so they're going to be uh less of those but more i think a, a, a deeper dive um and then a a, a a message board component. So the panels and book club will kick back up again soon. And then we're going to be doing interviews. Uh, there's a lot of folks out there who've been wanting to talk to us or uh, folks we've wanted to feature more. So we're going to be going in and, and getting a lot of those folks on the episode, uh, on these episodes talking. Uh, and we've done a few of those before in the past, but that's going to be a main feature going forward too. So lots to look forward to Todd, as we progress yeah. down this panelism road. Would you say, so there are, uh, I would you say that TLDR is that we are going to make sure that the titles of our episodes now <laughs> alert you to what we are talking about. Not that the title didn't already do that, but with the like watching or book club or something, I think, I think it's going to be when you look at all the episodes, like, you know, in mass, you'll be able to like pick out like, Oh, I want to, you know, check out the movie thoughts or the book thoughts or whatever. Exactly. So and like one, if there's, Oh, go ahead. Oh, one other thing we've talked about is with that book club is trying to get a little bit better about uh, telling each other, but also telling you what yes. book will be coming up so we can. So sometimes I, I, I don't you and I haven't talked about this too much. I think I think we're going to have to incorporate a lot of just traditional reviews where, yep. Yep. I, you know, only one of us has read the book. But we will also try to when we do a collective book announce in advance so that our listeners can read the book as well. And then sort of enjoy a little book club esque feeling, and of course, exactly. chat about it on whatever channel we decide on. We're we're kind of up in the air right now, so, so if you have yeah. suggestions on that, let us know. But really, Instagram's been our only social media for the past year, so we might dip into Reddit. We might dip into some other other options too. So if there, yeah, if there's a place where you go to talk about stuff or books you're reading or geeky stuff, like let us know what it is because we might use that for our our book club uh, our book club channel. Um, but yeah, it, it's funny when you said TLDR, I'm, I, it's been a long day for me, Todd, work-wise. We're recording this on a Monday and it's been a long Monday. And when you said TLDR, I was thinking Texas Department of License and Regulation. Oh, I, I thought you were that. thinking a uh, total request live with Carson Daly. Oh, yeah. TRL. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, TRLD. No, I don't know what it was. I... <laughs> total request. Live. Wow. That, that takes me back. What a, what a, <laughs> those, you know. Those if, were like all the rage. CMT, country music television had one for a while too. I remember there was like these, yeah. these 
these low impact, I mean, they were very cheap to make. It's just like, you know, a corner of a room somewhere, uh, you yeah. know, a, 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 a couple stools for some, you know, maybe 10 people in an audience and a guy. And that's yeah. kind of it. Just if you told videos. me 20 years ago that Carson Daly of the power couple, Carson Daly and Tara Reed <laughs> would eventually be wearing a suit every day and be on the Today Show, I would have said, oh, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> be careful with that thinking. Carson Daly and Tara Reid might end up... That wouldn't surprise me at all. <laughs> they may end up president and first lady of this country. You don't know. It's the, we live in that sort of world now where first lady or even president Tara Reid, he might be the first gentleman. We don't know. They'll get back together. For They'll sure. remind us of how good the 90s were. And we'll just be yeah. like, hey, let's just go back to that. Hey, make the yeah. 90s great again. Anyway. The star of Sharknado's... Um, and Carson Daly. Oh, they kept making them. Well, as we said, <laughs> as we said, we are, this is a panelism watching episode. And if it's not clear by now, we are going to be talking about HBO's Watchmen series, uh, which just concluded the third episode last night as of this recording. And which I think we it, didn't really know that we were going to talk about it. On no. a, like we, this only came up like before the third episode aired. Yeah, uh, well, and it, and it, it's you know because we've tried this a few times. You know, we've had a we had a fairly successful show called Wednesday in Westeros, where Todd and I talked Game of Thrones along with Emily Kelly and various others over the years. Um, and that ended when Game of Thrones ended. Uh, we were thinking of maybe doing another, uh, you know, maybe a small episode or two. Just haven't really gotten around to it. But that was kind of our big TV watching. Ex- oh wait, exercise. You're, you're you're leaving one out. <laughs> Well, I'm getting to that. So we try. <laughs> so we did that. We're like, that's fun. And then it's like, I had this grand idea because um, American Gods, the Neil Gaiman uh, book now series was coming out. I'm like, well, oh, this, this is clearly going to be the next Game of Thrones. It's going to be amazing. Uh, let's do it. And we actually, I actually set up a feed, a website URL and everything for American Gods cast. And after about three episodes of that show, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore, Todd. And we stopped <laughs> and it. Neither did I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we stopped it and and never spoken of it again until now. And so I think there was some I, hesitancy to do it again yeah. with any sort of intention. Like, well, I mean, and I, I'll be honest, I did, given that it's Damon Lindelof and the fact that it's like, well, do we need a Watchmen kind of reboot? Series? I don't know. I just, it didn't seem like it was going to be something that I was going to stick around for much, you know, much at all. And lo and behold, it's, possibly one of my new favorite things ever at least for at least so far i don't know about yeah. you there's a there's a pretty epic uh podcast episode of ours from a few years ago where we were talking about summer movies like it's just epic in the sense that like we i think we did a preview of it and you talked about the damon lindelof uh vehicle or <laughs> project whatever we want to call it tomorrowland oh, you know yes. based on an area of walt disney world <laughs> That people go to. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm just, I have a memory of this that could be totally inaccurate, but I remember you like sort of previewing it like, well, you know, it's, it's Lindelof and he kind of didn't stick the landing of a lost, but kinda. like, he's just so fascinating and this looks amazing. And then we did a, like another episode after you had watched it and you're like, yeah, that was not good. <laughs> No. I, I'm going to take and issue so, with your use of the word kind of, though. Right, he didn't right, right. just no, kind of not stick the landing. He saw <laughs> the landing strip and went, nope, and turned around and drove, like, flew right over it and on into the distance, and we never saw him again. So yeah, no. so, for sure. Um, I, <laughs> Much like Tomorrowland, I feel like our American Gods cast was our Tomorrowland. Yes, yes. It, it was... Uh, <laughs> Totally was. It was our Ishtar. <laughs> if you if you're deadly if you're if you're listening to this, you're like, what could they possibly be talking about? Go. I, I think it's still floating out there somewhere in some form or fashion. But it was not. I mean, if you not, liked if you liked yeah. American Gods, more power to you. I did not. <laughs> I, I yeah, we were not. Uh, it was not a failure on our our part. I believe we. That's right. We, we were diligent. The episodes fine. Yeah. I took we'll good. See. I took thorough notes. It just. Oh my god. Off. But anyway, yeah. so so this is kind of the opposite <laughs> of that, where almost almost to the same degree, it's like three episodes. It's like, shoot, we should start talking about Watchmen. Yeah, it's well, gonna be the best thing HBO's done outside of Game of Thrones until I guess right now, as we speak, the um, uh, Dark Materials is is airing. Yeah. Um, so that's probably sort another starting, one. We may right? talk about that too at some point. Who knows? Yeah, and I th- and I like that you mentioned. Uh, although I I diverted us like too much. Um, you mentioned that like we there was definitely like a. Uh, hesitation to cover another show like that. And we, yeah. and, you know, this could go totally sideways. Like Watchmen could totally, they could totally Lindelof this. 
Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> that's, well, here's my, here's and my we analogy. just stopped talking about it and that's fine. Here's, um, here's my little, here's my little analogy. Damon Lindelof is like a kid in a restaurant holding a stick of dynamite and you walk into the restaurant and you're like, holy crap, he's hold that kid's holding dynamite. And he's just calmly sitting there and he looks at you and he goes, just watch this. And you're watching the dynamite. But meanwhile, his you know, part of his ear is missing. Maybe he's missing a few fingers. Um, you know, has a big old scar on his leg or his face from like a previous accident. And you're just like, why? Okay, kid, you don't look like you know what you're doing. Maybe you should put that down. He's like, no, 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 just, just watch. Just trust me. This will be cool. And you're like, but you don't. Oh, okay. And the, just, that's kind of where we are with Damon Lindelof right now. It is, you know, it, I try, oh, I, so far I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. And so far what we've seen and the fact that keep this in mind, it's not he and somebody else. It's just him. He's, he's the writing. showrunner. Yeah. He's the showrunner. He's co-writing every episode with somebody else. He's also the one of the main executive producers. So this is largely his vision. He can't claim that, like, oh no, the network didn't want like this is on him. So, you know, I, I never watched the leftovers. I've heard it it's pretty good. Maybe that was his yeah, I heard sort good of stuff about that. Path to redemption in terms of storytelling. Um, but here we are. We're it's HBO's running it. We're three episodes in. Um, and you know what we did this time was uh, we waited three episodes to, yes. uh, to talk yeah. about it, which was definitely a good move. Um, I, because I, I feel like we've now got enough momentum. Uh, yeah, exactly. If we, if we had tried to do something after that first episode, even though I loved it, I'm afraid my, that our conversation would have been like, well, like, <laughs> let's still hold our yeah. breath. I don't yeah. know. Because um, pilots are deceiving, you know, pilots can be all, you know, like th that's, yeah. that's kind of putting your, all your, your cards on the table. And then sometimes after the pilot, it's like, well, hmm, I, I would say, and over the years, you and I have mentioned Watchmen many, many times. We and are, uh, uh, you know, for better or worse, like we both like the movie. <laughs> Yeah, and we know that that is a somewhat controversial statement in in comic book geekery land, um, and we both like the book a lot and see them as distinct things. And you have talked about before Watchmen. I've read yeah. like w one of those sagas, um, and I I I think that was a a thing where you could pick and choose what was good, you know, out of it. Um, and there was definitely some really good stuff. And uh, I don't know that either of us has read any of the DC like whatever that like Doomsday Clock stuff was. I somehow... will not be. I will not be doing that. No, I, I read two issues of that and was like, nope. And uh, it oh, okay, just, good. Yeah. It didn't, so uh, you know, I, I I would say our approach to this was you know that that maybe adds a little bit to the guarded nature with which we approach the show. And honestly, this is the thing I was thinking about after we talked yesterday to plan you know, recording this was, uh, I, I thought, you know, I, when I saw like the comic book, the, sorry, the comic con trailer for Watchmen, I was like, holy shit, this is what I've been waiting for. This is awesome. Mm. And there wasn't anything that really happened in it. It was just sort of like, you know, tense moments and the was way that it was the tick tock, tick tock. Yeah. That was that, that trailer. And I, I think so. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in like Don Johnson looks good. Let's just do it. This is great. Uh, but then after the boys, I think my enthusiasm level dropped because I just thought like, oh, no, now I don't know where they're going to fit in the universe. Like where the Watchmen, you know, is the Watchmen going to be like, you know, and not that they were, you know, not that it was like in response to it. They were obviously like made at the same time. But I just thought like, oh, is it going to be even more violent or more like, is it not going to sort of embody the weirdo world of the Watchmen? So I have been totally relieved that this this world is just as strange as the movie and the book, you know? But it, it also, it, it kind of has its cake, cake and eats it too in the fact that they are doing, so in, whoops, sorry, in the um, in the original Watchmen graphic novel and then even in the before Watchmen, um, which is a little tricky because before Watchmen is a bunch of different series, but there is a common thread um, in this, the Curse of the Black, Oh, hang on. Watch my curse. Oh, the uh, black, uh, the uh, the black freighter. Thing. Yeah, curse of the black freighter. But there's, I forget what the one in the uh, before Watchmen is called. It's it's like a, an extension right, right. of that same story. Yeah. Um. But yeah, curse tales of the black freighter is a sort of comic when within a comic that appears in the first in the in the Watchmen book itself, and it sort of, it does this clever thing where it kind of 
comments on the main, like the alpha storyline, while also kind of being a mirror to it. And mm-hmm. it's just, just beautiful, uh, you know, d- device that they kind of keep coming back to. Well, in the HBO Watchmen series, they're doing exactly that same thing, only they're ha- it's like this kind of Ken Burns doc, well, not Ken Burns, this kind of documentary series about the actual like Minutemen. Um, and probably eventually the original Watchmen too. Uh, but they're, yeah. they keep kind of cutting to it. Like you see the advertisements for the show in the world. And then every now and then they'll well, just I- cut to an episode of the, yeah. you know, of the actual show. And what's really funny about this is especially in the, and by the way, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. If you haven't watched any of this yet, please pause because I, from this point yeah. on, I'm not going to hold my tongue, but there is a, in episode two, I believe. There is a wonderful um, uh, Hooded Justice uh, episode of this sort of like meta Jeez. series that they're doing. And yeah. it itself looks exactly like the production yeah. of the Watchmen movie. It's like Zack Snyder directed this little insert. And, and now almost... in episode three, I love that that you said that in episode three, one of the advertisements that, that goes by on a bus, I am fairly certain has the actual faces of the actors from the Zack Snyder movie. They look pretty damn close. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll just correct one thing. I don't, I don't, or not correct, but I'll raise the question. I don't think it's a documentary. I think this is like entertainment. Like it's, you know, like the true stories, but in, in you know, embellished a little bit. Like oh, that, This see. is their entertainment for the world is like reliving the, you know, Minutemen glory. The glory days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just seeing that hooded justice thing where, you know, it's all slow oh motion God. and then really yeah. fast and then slow motion and just yeah. that, that 300 <laughs> style of movie making. And yeah, even the of, coloring looks like Zack Snyder. Yeah, that, that super saturated red that you see. Just, <laughs> I mean, it was so fun to watch that and just having the show acknowledge all the different, I mean, it's acknowledging the original graphic novel in really cool ways, but it's also acknowledging the movie and I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's acknowledging before Watchmen 2. We'll get to that more in just a bit when we start talking about all the crazy theories that are is, are already surrounding the show. Um, you know, you don't get Damon Lindelof without a bunch of theories that may or may not end up panning out. Maybe some of them are there just for distraction purposes or for meta purposes. I don't know. But we'll get more into that in a little in a little bit. But I guess to, to, to kind of really dive in, what are your – I mean, on a – Give me your Siskel and Ebert review. Like what, how are you liking it so far? What, what, what don't you like about it? If anything, what, you know, you already, I mean, it's already clear you're a fan, but like what's, yeah. you know, how is it, how is it working for you? I, I'm still definitely guarded about it. Um, I, nothing has turned the corner, uh, like it did with American gods and I have no hint that it will. Um, last night's episode was, uh, was a big deal. I think in that, We knew from episode one, I mean, you know, like they, the characters in the world had a different, uh, there's an acknowledgement of the original Watchmen characters, but there was almost like a different origin story for the ones that we were following in the first two episodes because we were following, uh, Judd, um, I cannot remember his last name Crawford, and, um, and, uh, sister Knight, uh, or Angela, um, I can't remember her last name in that, but, but they were two cops in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who after this event called the white Knight, in which a bunch of white supremacists, uh, wearing Rorschach masks, actually, I don't think they were wearing them because we do see a flashback to that in episode two. I don't think they're wearing the masks during white Knight. They are. No, no, they are. Oh, they are. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So they, they found out where the, on one night they broke into every cop's house in the city and killed co- many, many cops and family members. Um, Judd and Angela uh, both escaped, but they were, they were both shot. Um, there was like, I think it's Angela's partner that dies tragically and she ends up adopting his kids. Uh, and so they have an, an origin story that is specific to the series world. You know, it's not picking up after like, uh, although we, we do meet Adrian Veidt and we're very certain that it's him up until episode three, when it's definitely acknowledged that it's him, like, we know we're in the world, but it's not it's not like a continuation of the story of the movie or the book. Well, is, that, is, is that a good way is, of saying it? It is and it isn't. I mean, Dr. Right. Manhattan yeah, yeah. exists. They're like, he's on Mars now. And in the yeah. book, he goes to – I mean, the movie – yeah. the main difference between the book and the movie, if you're not aware, is that the book, um, Adrian Veidt tries to trick the world into unifying by dropping a giant psychic alien squid onto New York, killing a – you know, million people. Million. And then yeah. just the, the idea, like 
he engineered it in such a way that it would create such dread at, at an existential level that everybody would kind of band together. And then Rorschach was going to expose him. Dr. Manhattan kills Rorschach as he does in the movie. And then Dr. Manhattan says, you know, I'm done with this. I, I've, I can't stay here anymore. I'm going to go to Mars. And then it ends. The movie, Adrian Veidt tries to set up Dr. Manhattan as the cause of what's going on. It doesn't quite, it, it, it's fine. It doesn't quite work the same way. So you almost have to ignore that. Um, so in the, in the show, like it, Manhattan is on Mars. It's kind of clever. And in, in the third episode, they have these like almost like novelty phone booths that you can get into. And I, you know, give Dr. Manhattan a call and just, you know, he's listening just yeah. like that kind of stuff. So that it is. Yeah. They're, the, they're there. And there's certainly like, there's a big impact of them, but it, I just mean, it's not the, you know, it doesn't pick up where the events in. Oh, sure. No, so I, I love that. There's like a new origin story for these people that it's centered on. And that yeah, origin yeah. story is in this racism um, and this real historical event, the Tulsa race riots, um, which I did not know about until this freaking show. Very few is, people did. That's yeah. Was, I'm shocked. And it's a massive race riot that happened in 1921. On Black um, Wall Street. Yes. In Tulsa, like the wealthiest black neighborhood in America, uh, white people just straight up flew planes in and on the streets, like beat up, arrested, killed killed, uh, so many uh, black people. It's awful. Um, anyway, I didn't, but that's a really interesting, like real world thing that they've grounded this movie in, um, or sorry, this movie, the series in, and, uh, I, I, all of this is very appealing to me. Like, you know, it's like, there's still, there's the (laughs) Nixon cult, um, which is great because they don't have to update it uh, in <laughs> to comment on recent events, you know. Well, uh, in the but in this in the in this uh, timeline of the story, Nixon wins a third term. So in well, the graphic yeah, novel, he, like he's lifts the the ban on yeah multiple terms and yeah. Yeah, so this Nixon has a even more powerful. He wasn't impeached, and he had a third term, so he has a more powerful sort of mythos. I think in the in the Watchmen universe, so it makes sense well, that there would be like Nixonville. I think he's okay. I could be wrong. I am Googling this right now. So, um, but I, I think that he becomes like the forever president in Watchmen. No, no. Cause in this, in this universe, Robert Redford is president, like in the show. Um, the actor, Robert Redford is president. Gotcha. That's why they call them Redford, Redford rations. I can't say it. Instead of oh, reparations. Oh, oh. So instead of, uh, um, Republican actor Ronald Reagan becoming president, uh, Democrat actor Robert, Robert Redford. Redford. Yeah. How did yeah. I miss that? Or is that just a background it's, thing that has well, not been revealed yet? He, it, it, it's briefly touched on in the show, but then there is, just like in Watchmen, the graphic novel, there is a bunch of supplemental material published on um, hbo.com slash paytypedia, P-E-T-E-Y-pedia. And it's all that same stuff that would appear at the end of each chapter or issue of Watchmen. Oh. So newspaper clippings, bios, book excerpts, all this kind of wonderful contextual stuff that Alan Moore is really good at. Um, they're doing that for this, but they're putting it here instead. And there's at least two things there that mention President Robert Redford as well. So oh, interesting. Really, if you're getting into the weeds, you can, you can, but I think in the show, they've acknowledged it subtly. My yeah. only question is, is he going to actually appear as the actor, Robert Redford? I mean, I, I hope so. Just that, would be, that would be, that would be amazing. That's actually what I thought you meant at first. Um, uh, so yeah, one slight cor- correction, uh, is that I'm, I'm looking at the Watchmen wiki and in the, in the book, he, Nixon was elected in 68 and was at least president until 85. He was reelected repeatedly is what it says. Okay. okay. <laughs> so in 84, he was reelected. And then I guess the events of the book happened in 85. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I, you had asked this question, um, about like what, how I'm liking it. And I had talked about that new setting for this, but that uses the old setting. And then last night in episode three, um, I really felt like stuff coming together when we find uh, Lori Jupiter or whatever that other name she has is uh, the Silk Spectre two. Um, yes, yes, she is now Blake. Uh, I, I think she was. I think she had a, another name uh, somewhere in there. But yeah, anyway, um, that felt so cool to me, and especially to have uh, Jean Smart playing her. Oh, I love um, Jean Smart so yeah. much. It's so fun to see her pop up in this. Like, what a great 
what a great turn for her. How did you feel about her characterization of Lori? I thought it, okay, it's interesting because I, and we'll get to this again in just a minute or two, we'll talk more about this, but I was pretty solidly convinced that, um, she was going to be a big red herring and that the, Ooh. that Judd's wife, because I, I think that Judd is actually, uh, um, I just I can't think of names today. Yeah, Night Owl. Uh, Dan, Dan Dryberg. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think Judd, uh, Judd is really Dan Dryberg. Um, as an alias, and I thought that his wife in the show was Lori Blake, or just or right. was Lori or Jupiter. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, when that's clearly not the case now, although I'm curious, she went to go visit in episode three. She goes to visit their house, and we never get to see what their conversation is. So I'm guessing that'll have more rich input at that point too. But um, knowing that that Gene Smart is playing the actual former Silk Spectre, I loved your characterization. It was exactly like what you'd expect that person to be at that point in their life, having done all the things that we know she's jaded. She's still like, you know, she's trying to do good, but now she's working within the system. Um, she's kind of above the the system in some ways, you know, she kind of gets to call her own shots, but she's still, you know, she, it's just, it, she's complicated. And I, I mean, the only that she is playing exactly who would be the daughter of the comedian and the original silk specter. Like that's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little of both. It's that duality of like, you know, a femme fatale, but like with just the sort of hard ass, like, I don't give a shit. Like, I'm just going to do what I want. That's, that's what she was playing. I just, she, I like that. And I like that she still has these nostalgic feelings for John, um, Dr. Manhattan. Like she's, Ugh, you know, that yeah. when she's in that phone booth, t- you know, talking, basically giving her recording, just, it was, it really did remind me of like a, a former ex just being like, Hey man, how are you? Hope you're well. You know, just kind of that, that sort of almost lost kind of meandering, just, you know, I wish things were the way they used to be feeling. Yeah. And, uh, I, I don't know where I wanted to go from like that Sorry, whole yeah, yeah, yeah. Lori thing, but, um, uh, let's, let's, do, let's dive into, cause there's some other members of the cast that I think it, what's interesting about oh this God. cast is that, and Linda Lof is doing this beautiful thing where it's a sequel and it's a reboot, but not completely. It's kind of a remix, but it's all it's yeah. it's kind of everything to everybody because <laughs> it's it is a sequel in terms of like this is 34 years after the events of the first one, but it's not a reboot. But we're seeing a lot of the same kind of characters reappear. So Sister Night is basically Night Owl. Um, the uh, Looking Glass guy who Tim Blake Nelson plays is basically Rorschach. Um, the Red Scare is basically the comedian. And on and on and on and on. So we've got these yeah. like stand-ins for the traditional Watchmen um, group. And I'm even going to throw one more in there, too. There's not a Dr. Manhattan, because I think that there can only be one. But I think Senator Joe Keane is also sort of the stand-in for Ozymandias or Adrian Veidt. He's yeah, playing yeah. that sort of you know, good guy, like, just, you know, trust me, everything's going good. I, th- I think something's not going good with him. We'll get to that soon. Um, but this cast is just really, is really great. And we get like the fact that Lewis Gossett Jr., uh, oh the gosh. guy, he's playing Will, the guy in the wheelchair, very likely might be the actual, um, you know, the actual Hooded Justice character. Like that might be who that <gasps> is. So we're getting all of this wonderful, that's speculation, by the way, that's not sort of, that's not, proven as of yet um there's a lot of there's a lot of signs point to it but th- we're getting like all of this rich history and these characters that are it's almost kind of like Battlestar Galacta like what happened before is happening again uh, like it the, just happens yeah. to be happening in Tulsa in this moment yeah but you get all these all these same these kind of same characters I mean uh Tim Blake Nelson is just I almost like him as Rorschach better dare I say than um uh, uh, oh God, what's the guy in the movie who played him who just crushed it? Uh, Haley, oh, Haley, uh, uh, ah, darn it. I know. Well, uh-huh. I remembered, I remember what the, the question I was going to ask you. Uh, although if you have a whole crazy theory section outlined, we can just get to my question then. But, I do, um, and we can, and we can just okay. jump into that now if you want. <laughs> well, I, or if we just want to like keep Jackie back Earl into Haley, it. by the way, Jackie Earl Haley, yeah, props yeah. to Jackie Earl Haley who played. Rorschach in the movie, by the way, one thing to mention, and I've been talking about this with um, Charles Wefso, who hosts the Hardy Boys Drink Book podcast, also on uh, the Panelism Network. Check that out, too. He's he's the biggest Alan Moore fan I know. Um, and he was really scared about the show, too. And he's absolutely delighted because it is it's doing to Watchmen what Watchmen originally did to the Charlton characters. And then a lot mm, of the comics yeah. medium at that time, too, like 
like Rorschach was kind of a was meant to take the piss out of like the Steve Ditko kind of like, you know, Randian kind of superhero, right? And it's it's interesting that we're seeing you know, Lindelof is taking those characters and now remixing them in a, in a similar way, in a very punk rock kind of way, which I would I would hope Alan Moore would appreciate, but he's so curmudgeonly these days, yeah. who knows? But the Rorschach character in the movie, this is why I bring all this up, he's kind of, I mean, he he's a fan favorite. He's like, Jackie Earl Haley plays him amazingly well. He's cool. He's oh, right, like, right. You, you think he's like the moral center of this whole thing. That was kind of a misconception. Like, he, Alan Moore never wanted that character to be anything more than just like a loser, right? Like just a mm. weird sort of racist. It, and it's that know, weird thing of like, r- right, right, right. He's a racist and a, and a homophobe who is actually kind of right about something. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's the like terrible ambiguity of Rorschach is that, yeah, like he, he actually could have saved everyone. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and it, it bothered me because right out of the gate, I was like, why would a group of white supremacists choose him as their I'm, sort of, as That's they're the like, question you know, I was going to get to <laughs> their mascot. And it's like, and you can say, well, the journal was leaked, you know, so in the continuity of right. the story, the Perfect. journal is dropped off and it was circulated and published. So people yeah. know who he is and kind of what he stood for. But I did, I just, I never thought until I talked to Charles, I never thought that he would have, it just seemed odd. And he's like, no, actually it's, it's, it's kind of appropriate. These guys needed sort of a, you know, kind of a, a conspiracy theory theorist kind of father. Oh, yeah figure or like sort of like you know a, a, a patron saint if you will um and he, it kind of works in that regard and of course any fringe group i mean this is going to sound controversial but the original version of breitbart was not at all what it is now andrew breitbart created a, a, a site that was heavily conservative but it wasn't this he dies and they take it completely off the rails into what it currently is and it's like i can almost see the same idea like hey rorschach's journal they just you know, any, any kind of fringe group is going to take something way past its, its original intention. Um, I mean, Jesus, most religions are kind of that way too. It's like, Hey, <laughs> a guy says this, let's take it to the extreme, you know? And, well, see- and generally speaking too, like, I mean, that's, that's where I think Alan Moore was just comfortable to, to live in the ambiguity of it and yeah. not have to come down on a side of like Rorschach's good or he's bad. It's like, he's got, he's got all these flaws and he's, he's not a, a decent person really like he's just he's just not like but he's right about something you know and um i you don't have to work very uh, hard to like you know create an analog to that in our actual current culture of you know people uh their ideology sort of getting ahead of them and they're sort of uh, hero worshiping someone and um, I think what Watchmen is doing is making it specifically racist. And in our, you know, our, our current culture, it's sort of like people are signing up for something and not thinking about its racist qualities. Uh, yeah. yeah just trying to this, talk though. around that. But why do you think a group of white supremacists would target the police? That just seemed a little disconnected for me too. Cause I'm like that of all the things to do, why go after the, like, wouldn't you want to infiltrate the cops and, you know, mm. take them over? Like, why would you just go, well, how does that fit together? I, I, do you have That's a take on that? That's interesting um, because one thing you do notice uh, is that the beat cops are are, are largely black. Yeah, in Tulsa. Um, and Judd Crawford is not. And so you're I, – I think – I mean that was absolutely intentional for sure. Yeah. Um, Judd Crawford also lives in a weird Bruce Wayne, Bruce Wayne, Wayne mansion. Yeah, totally. Which um, I, have a, I have a pretty good idea of why, but go on. <laughs> um and it's hard to, I mean, another thing I like about the show is that it's not giving us all these answers. Like it's not just sort of lining up the history for you and you go, Oh, okay. I get it. It's like things keep falling into place with every episode as well as something else coming totally out of place. And you're like, okay, now we got to wait to figure that thing out. Um, so I, it's hard to say if the police force now is largely black because of the events of the white night mm. or were they always, uh, a, a majority African American, and that was what caused the White Knight. You know, oh, um, interesting. But generally speaking, like, uh, you know, w- w- racists sort of at their core don't recognize the <laughs> individual rights of anyone else, so they, you know, lash out at people who protect those individual rights. Um, yeah. But it is definitely like a flip uh, where it would have been really easy, like, and and a little bit lazy to have 
the police force itself be the racist institution, you know? So yeah. Um, yeah. it's it's kind of a twist on that thing. I mean, you don't know, like, it's very much like the original graphic novel, which is like, you don't know who's, you can't break this into good guys and bad guys. Because when Lori shows up, she freaking knows. So so basically, uh, you know, if you uh, if you watch the show at all, you know that, uh, and which you should be if you're listening this far into the podcast, um, the police are now allowed to wear masks in Oklahoma um, to protect their identities. When Lori shows up, she clearly knows everyone's identity. Yeah. And that really puts them on guard. And it's to think of it like, oh, here's a federal law enforcement officer who, you know, just like walks in and starts announcing everyone's secrets is like... Oh, yeah, who is the good guy? You know, is it the Oklahoma police who are like going through this absolutely crazy, you know, like civil rights uh, interrogation thing by episode three, um, just interrogating everyone of what's it called? Nixon land or Nixonville, you know, that, something Nixonville, like it's like <laughs> yeah, a yeah. Hooverville with Nixon. It's, it's, <laughs> I, it's um, yeah, it's. I like that mix up of all those things because that was what the Watchmen graphic novel did. You, you, you couldn't figure out who, like, I mean, everyone seemed to be uh, ambiguous in that way. You know, yeah. even the comedian at times seemed like a real hero and yeah, he's a scumbag, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Um, I, like when, uh, when Dan, I, I, that, that scene where he and Dan, uh, you know, in the movie, in the movie yeah. We're like team up and you're like, it, there's this incongruity to like, why are they together? And then you're like, but somehow it makes sense. Yeah. You know, yeah, anyway. Well, let's jump into because I think a lot of uh, we're dancing around a lot of theories, and I just want to jump. Yeah, right yeah, in. yeah, hit the theories. There's a, and I'll I'll start with the biggest one first because I think it is the most formative one for the series, and that is what is Judd Crawford's deal? Uh, <laughs> Judd Crawford, of course, the character played by Don Johnson. Which, by the way, God, Don Johnson. Every time he's in anything, he just gets better and better, and seems to always be yeah. needing a cowboy hat. I don't I don't know what that's about, but he's. He is, um, he's becoming almost like he's having like this Michael Keaton kind of renaissance in the last several years. It's just, you know, he's a dependable guy and he's, his acting is just better and better and better. I love it. But he, I, yeah, I, I don't understand his, uh, he feels, um, who's the guy that famously got like blacklisted that's now on, uh, uh, NCIS or whatever, but he feels like, like he just disappeared and people thought of him as like a TV actor or something. Yeah. This guy is a heavyweight. Like he's like a Kevin Costner. Yeah. Like I, I could see him in any like role that Kevin Costner's in, you know, like 100%. at this, at this yeah. age in his life and all of that, like he, He's kicking ass. One of the best Don Johnson roles ever is his turn in um, Django Unchained. Like, just, I mean, uh -huh. I've never laughed so hard at things that that man has said. Just, I mean, what a great, what a great character. But here's the deal. On this, there's a couple things that, that really jump out at me. And these may all be red herrings, but I, it, it'd be really hard to explain these away. I'm just going to come out and say it. I think Judd Crawford is Dan Dryberg in Cognito. And if you think about it, at the end of Watchmen, both Dan Dryberg and Laurie, um, they're together at that point in time. They go in, they go undercover, they change their appearance, and they have um, they have uh, different names. I forget. Oh, I should have looked this up already. Yeah. It's, they have like alliterative names, essentially. And they're undercover, and they're sort of like hiding out at the end of the, the events of Watchmen. At some point, um, and I don't know exactly when this happens, but um, Laurie goes on to become the comedian um for a, a, a time maybe in the like the late 80s she comes back at some point they both come out of hiding or she does anyway now in the supplemental materials that you find on paydpedia or pdpedia um it does slightly suggest that dan dryberg is in federal custody yes. but think about all the things that we have seen so far judd crawford owns the owl ship for some bizarre reason like he's just hanging out in the owl ship during their raid in episode one um and it's like, it's never explained why the police has it. He's in it like he's had it his whole life. Um, number two, Dan Dryberg inherited a lot of money from his father, which allowed him to basically become Night Owl. So he, you know, invested all that money and created his gadgets and stuff and everything. That's kind of, you know, he was almost like a Bruce Wayne kind of character, which would explain why the, Dry the Crawfords have this crazy manner in Tulsa while he's the police chief. Like, I don't, can't imagine, you know, that pays enough to have a, a crazy mansion on a hill. So there's that. Most importantly, I direct you to episode two, specifically at 41 minutes, 27 seconds. 
<laughs> I'm saying this because I want back everybody out there to go to the and left. do the I mean, seriously. Back and to the left. <laughs> <laughs> You're not kidding. There is a picture as as uh, Sister Knight, as Angela is going through his closet rooting around, there's a picture on his kind of nightstand. And it's a uh, older gentleman in a policeman's uniform and a younger boy in what looks like, you know, the 60s, somewhere. And it's a black and white photograph. The only thing I can think of in that scene is, oh my God, that's Hollis Mason and that's a young Dan Dryberg. That's how he met the original Night Owl. Like the original Night Owl, Hollis Mason, was a police officer who started to dress up to because they weren't getting the job done. So he he dressed up as you created this character of Night Owl. At some point, a young boy named Dan Dryberg befriends him. Uh, Hollis Mason tutors him and basically makes him his apprentice so that he can become the next, the new night owl. So there's this picture sitting there, plain as day. Nobody has, I've mentioned this now to like seven people. Nobody has picked up on this. I don't understand. So you've so, got all oh, this evidence. You well, you've got all this evidence building up and the fact that she, uh, uh, Angela's rooting around his closet. She, you know, with her her spy glasses, she notices a you know a false wall, just like we saw in the comedian's apartment after he dies. And I, the only thing I could think of, oh, the wall's gonna move, and we're gonna see the night owl costume. Only instead, we see a, a clan outfit, which we can talk with, more about in a minute. Yeah, with a uh, uh, a police badge on it. Yeah. So you know. <sighs> All right. I don't know. So, I mean. That could I, be his, go, go ahead. You you, go. you floated this theory to me before episode three. Yeah. And I was like, that's interesting. I got to, I got to watch it with the, an eye towards that. Um, because I did not, like I, like I told you yesterday, I did not expect a reveal of the night owl costume in the closet, but there was something uh, like the elements were all kind of there. Like the, the glasses, the goggles that Angela is wearing are like straight up night owl gadgetry yeah. anyway so yeah think, well, there was all this like night owl stuff around them real quick though real quick it's also important to acknowledge that judd is her mentor right yes. and so it's like she it, it's like the way she's behaving as sister night is very night owl-esque it sure. just it, it's like where did she get that otherwise like where would she have picked up all those habits and you know it's like she had to be trained by somebody who knows what they're doing let me add one more and i, I promise i'll let you go one more log on the fire there is, especially in episode one, at least three separate occasions when somebody comes to Judd's house or, or wherever he is and they're like, hey, you got to come with us. He's like, OK, let me put on my uniform first. And there's this very deliberate scene of him putting on his uniform as though like he's, you know, all I can think of, you're a former hero. You're a former mask who is now like, you know, you put that life behind you, but you're still suiting up. You're still putting on that uniform to go out and and be this character, you know, like and it. it it's rare to see like a police chief be that decked out, you know, for, you know, to go visit, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the widow of a, of a dead, you know, dead cop or something. Maybe it's, maybe it's more common than I think, but just, it had this element of like him suiting up, you know, just like he used to. Anyway, go ahead. What's, what so are your thoughts on all I, yeah, I thought, I thought that was interesting. And then episode three happened and I think you're wrong. Uh, right. when Senator Keene visits Lori Blake um, wherever she lives, uh, we see Lori Blake take down a vigilante in this like really elaborate <laughs> scheme. Oh yeah. At the bank, <laughs> at the bank. Um, and then Joe Keen visits her. Uh, it almost looks like a hotel room, but th she does call it her home. It's like her condo. Um, we learn that she has a pet owl that yep. she keeps in a cage. Um, and Joe Keen like sees the owl, like asks her about it. Its name is who, um, and he says, uh, she, she says something like, you're just trying to be president. And he it, like talks in a, a very, um, uh, way, you know, roundabout way of saying like, not acknowledging that, but saying if he were president, he would have some pardoning powers and he could even pardon, he could even get her owl out from behind those bars. Yeah. And I, I think I, he means Dan, who is in federal custody. Oh, he absolutely means Dan. But my thought is, like, why can't that just be a, a – why does that have to be true? Like, that could be a, a, a stand-in. That could be anything. Like, if you were if you were the real Night Owl, which is basically, you know, basically Batman, you know, there's a, a huge detective quality. There's a lot of subterfuge and a lot of that. And especially at the end of the book, like, they went into hiding. You know, they went – they changed their identities at the end of the graphic novel. 
Not so much in the movie, by the way. That was they did not do that in the movie, which is right. interesting. But they, but like, if you're gonna go into hiding, change your identity, go through all the, like, wouldn't you have a, uh, you know, somebody in the system? Maybe Lori herself was like, oh yeah, we put him away. Uh, you know, like it's she's in the system. He's outside the system. It's like, I, I just I have this. I don't know. I just there's so many things that point to Judd because if he's not, if he's not Dan. And he doesn't have to be. I mean, it, it's perfectly fine for him to be his own character. It works just as well. But if he's not Dan, then like, why, why, where did he get the owl ship? Like, what? That wasn't even explained at all. It's just like, oh, he's just in the owl ship randomly. Remember how yeah. they even crashed it at the end of, um, you know, taking down that that airplane. You know, they they take it down, they shoot the flame out, the owl ship kind of crashes. Uh, Sister Knight thinks that they're dead, and he, and he pops out and he's laughing. And it's like it reminded me of that scene after. Um, Dan and Lori fight the the gang in the alley and they're like all invigorated again. Yeah. It's like, oh my yeah. God, I missed this. It reminded me of that. It's like, it's him reliving his old glory days. Like, oh man, we had uh, one more, you know, one more great, you know, great sort of uh, heroic act essentially. Yeah, um, I think it was meant to echo that. Um, but not, but not be. But, but not, I, I think it, this is like a, um, I think this is a case, like this is the classic Lindelof <laughs> oh, yeah. of like, planting clues all along and you're not necessarily sure of if what you're seeing is a clue or like a distraction, you know, kind of thing or an echo or whatever we want to call it. So, but I'm not saying like, I, I wouldn't put it past the character of Dan Dryberg to do something like that. But, um, I just, in last night's episode, I was like, Nope, I don't, I, I don't think so. I think, I think that's, what's more motivating Lori. And that's why she works for the federal government. And I think that, um, the night owl technology we're seeing, I, there's something going on there. And I don't know, I, this is a thing where I'm, I'm probably thinking something's a clue when it's not. Uh, I'm wondering if like the government just kind of stole technology from Dan or if Vite was involved somehow, because there's this weird thing in episode three where we see the millennium clock yeah. and this other character that I don't remember who works with Lori, um, mentions uh, um, that Vite sold his company to someone and that was part of it or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I just have the suspicion that Vite, you know, because his, his company, I think, invented a whole bunch of technology and stuff, right? Like that mm -hmm. was his deal. So I'm just wondering if he's somehow involved, you know, like he stole Dan's inventions and sold them or something. I don't know. You know, I'm. That's I'm, possible. I'm, yeah. I'm looking I'm looking for all those weird little connections like that. But, By the uh, way, the uh, the new owner of Vite Industries is True Industries, and we're gonna meet Lady True next week, oh. um, played by Hong Chao. Okay. Um, she's so let's go back because the other other big theory is what is the deal with Joe Keen? Um, Joe Keen yeah. is the senator in this. Now it's interesting because remember in the graphic novel, the Keen Act is what. Uh, was passed in the Watchmen universe so that it is illegal to have a, to basically be a mask. It's what ended the Watchmen originally. The Keen Act passed. So this is actually that guy's son in the in the continuity of the story. That Senator Keen oh, had gotcha. this Senator Keen, and he's now involved. But here's the deal: he is playing that character way too wholesome and way too much like Adrian Veidt in the original series. Um, and it's mm. just I and he and it even had that. There was a, a beautiful flash. Last night in episode three, where we were on, um, uh, which is, it's so stupid that they wouldn't acknowledge. I mean, like IMDB has had, um, uh, God almighty. What's his, uh, Jeremy Irons listed as Adrian Veidt, like since the show right. was even announced, it's like, he's playing Adrian Veidt. It's like, why keep that a secret? But they showed him in the, in the episode. And then they did that thing where they originally, they immediately jump cut to the next scene and yeah. his face is replaced by Joe, uh, Senator Joe Keene's face. And so I'm just like, Oh, that's Ooh, interesting. Good call. He's, I didn't and, notice that. And he's, but he's like, he's the guy who's kind of setting, if you think about it, like all of this could very well be his plan. Like this is just his plan unfolding. Mm. Maybe his, maybe his end game is to be president. Maybe it's something else. But remember in the original Watchmen, nobody suspected Vite of, you know, anything until the end. And it was like, he has, he was this wholesome all American kind of character, even though he's kind of German, he was this all American kind of character, like very, you know, very upstanding, you know, contributes and everything. And so it's like, I wonder if we're going to start to see the cracks in Joe Keen start to appear over time and even have a, you know, maybe an, a, an ending scene where it's like, you know, uh, 
uh, one of those you know, one of those moments where he's like, you know, I'm not a comic book villain. I you know my, I enacted my plan 30 minutes ago, or you know whatever. Something where it's something that kind of mirrors that original that original Ozymandias turn. Yeah. Um, the other big question, and this is probably the more fun question. Well, let me add something about Joe Keen, oh, yeah, please. which is, uh, and this is, this is again, this is me like hunting for clues where there probably aren't any, but I did think it was very uh, noticeable that in the Wikipedia and not PDPedia or whatever, <laughs> whatever you're talking about in Wikipedia, <laughs> when they describe the cast, just talking about the Watchmen TV series, they note that Joe Keen is the Republican Senator from Oklahoma. And I was like, that's so specific. Mm-hmm. Like why? I mean, in a world where like, I don't think that we've ever heard Republican or Democrat like mentioned in Watchmen, you know, yeah. and it's just weird that that landed on Wikipedia. Not that that means it's factual, but it's, it's an interesting thing because it, if there is a president Redford currently, it may mean that like that, you know, uh, contest is about to happen or something like that. Well, um, I think I think the big shock and awe is going to be around Joe Keen and not Judd Crawford. I think yes. if Judd Crawford, let's say, let's just say he's not Dan Dryberg. I mean, it, there could be any, maybe he has that, um, maybe his grandfather was in the clan and he keeps that as a reminder of what they're, what he's trying to, you know, escape. Like, you know, his family had this dark past and he keeps it as, I mean, there's any number of reasons he could have that hidden away in his closet. It doesn't have to be, Maybe he was ashamed of it. That's why he keeps it hidden. Like he doesn't—he doesn't have to be a secret Klansman. Except the only other thing about Joe, Judd Crawford that's interesting to me. Remember when the White Knight was happening and somebody breaks into Angela's house? She kills him. Somebody else breaks in. Yep. Like so, another person comes in, shoots her, and is standing over her, and she passes out. We don't know who that was mm, or yeah. how she got out of there, but the very next thing she sees, almost like another jump cut, is Judd Crawford's face in the hospital. So it's like, well, okay, maybe yeah. that guy was Judd, and you know he was, who knows what he was doing? Maybe he was the one that gave them all the cops' addresses. I, who knows? There's any number of things that could have, have happened with Judd. I think that's going to be the most interesting kind I mean, of reveal of the whole thing. Just the just the two like bits of filmmaking and editing you've mentioned are so they are just the, like the little touches that are happening in the show that are so cool um and another one i met, i noticed was not a jump cut but as Laurie blake walks up to crawford's house she's on the outside and they cut inside to her yes! getting to the door and her yes! eyes are framed by this like filigree on the door that looks exactly like an owl Oh, I love it. It looks like yeah. a mask. It looks yeah, like yeah. a mask on her face. It's amazing. And it's like, that honestly was the one time where I was like, oh shit, Taylor's right. He is the night owl. <laughs> I rewound it twice. Just I'm like, oh, that's a great, what a great shot. Yeah. Like she had to stand exactly right for that to come. Yeah. Like, and she's like approaching, you know, it's not yeah. just, she's not just solitary still. Like it's like, yeah, she's walking up a step and looks up to frame the face at just the right moment. It's, it's really cool. Also, big shout. I mean, the cinematography is uh, gorgeous. Oh yeah. Also, big shout out to Good Lord, um, Atticus Ross and um, Trent Reznor for the soundtrack. I mean, these are the guys who did the soundtrack for Social Media, or sorry, uh, the Social Network and G- Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Also, right. A ton of stuff. I mean, I'm I am. Just go look at their credits. They've been they have been crushing it on the soundtrack front lately for both TV and film. Um, Trent Reznor, of course, Nine Inch Nails, if you don't know, but that just that soundtrack, it's, it's very, oh, it's great. 80s, it's moody. It's eighties. It's got exactly the right tone for this show. I, I just love it. And the you know, other, they're, they're oh. getting away with like tons of music that is, that is moody and sets the tone without going the Zack Snyder way of like yeah. constantly throwing popular music in your face. Um, and I, I, I just appreciate that. I think that's really interesting. Like when they do play, uh, like pop music it 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 takes like it, it it cues something else in me where i'm like oh what am i listening to here because i i start doing this whole meta analysis of like okay well this exists in the world so that you know like that kind of thing which is just really neat like if it were straight up like bob dylan and you know um uh, uh leonard cohen and all that kind of stuff from the movie like i i would i don't know what i would feel i would just feel like oh this is way too familiar you yeah. know but the yeah, yeah resner finch thing is just keeps it off kilter yeah, all the time. So good. Um, yeah. other big, we, uh, other big theory, because this is, this is the most fun one. What is Adrian Veidt's situation? I thank you. That is exactly what I was going to bring up. 
Because he's like, <laughs> we see him, we meet him. He's in this kind of what I'm just going to call a snow globe reality. Like it's, you oh know, my there's, God. there seems to be sort of a, an insular nature to the world he's in. It seems like he's kind of on a, in a groundhog day loop of some kind. He's got these... Uh, servants who are all clones or uh, androids or automatons or who knows what. Um, I, what's your take? Because I have a very specific <laughs> idea that's kind of a little weird, but I want to hear yours first. There's a weird little mention that, like, when they talk about the death of Adrian Veidt, where uh, Dale, Petey, that's uh, the agent's name <laughs> I just looked up, um, who's with Lori. Um, wh- after they talk about uh, Ozymandias and what happened to Ad- after Adrian Veidt's death, where he disappeared for a while till they d- declared him dead. And, but there's some theory of him living. And I think they say Argentina, but I'm not totally sure. But to me, that cued me into like, this is a Nazi who, I mean, not, not that I don't mean that in a literal way, although, you know, he's definitely like a eugenicist, but, um, th- that they, it, it cued the, the Nazis like escaping Germany and going to live in Argentina and oh, being yeah. sort of protected that way. Um, and again, last night in episode three, you know, it's confirmed that it's Adrian Veidt. So we know he's alive. Um, and, and like you said, we knew that's who Jeremy Irons was playing. But it, it was neat for them to put that history in. Like we see him first. He's not named. Then we hear that history of like how he disappeared and was uh, declared dead. Then then it's confirmed that that's him. Um, so, and someone who seems like official, like, I can't remember what they called him, like not game warden or is it game warden? I don't remember, but he's, there's some like guy that's sort of patrolling the land that, uh, fires a warning shot at Vite after he kills a Buffalo, which was crazy. Who's wearing a domino mask. Let's yeah. <laughs> like the Lone Ranger. It's very interesting. Right? Yeah. And it's like, there's some official that knows that that's Adrian Vite, you know? So I, that's what I thought. I thought this is a Nazi in hiding kind of thing. Which, I which, love that take. I love that take because that is it does have yeah, it does have that kind of feel to it. Here's the thing though: the world he's in is very strange. Like the technology is very, you know, it, it's not very advanced. He's using like an old scuba uniform and a, and a, a, a giant rope, you know, on his um on his one of his servants to like test some theory, which I'm assuming is him trying to escape whatever this is. Um. If you watch episode one, there is a quick cutaway to Dr. Manhattan on Mars, like some like aerial footage. Mm. And he's building and then just he's building out of like Martian sand. And then he quickly destroys a house that is exactly the same model house that uh, Vite is living in. And also that that kid, um, uh, Angela's adopted son, uh, the dead, you know, the son of her dead partner. Yes. It's the same house that that kid is building. Wait, where is this Dr. Manhattan clip though? Very, it's in, it's in episode one. It's like, I'll find it. It's, it's like one, it's like a news thing. And they're like, Dr. Manhattan, it's like him. You see him on Mars and he's like, he's again, it's like an aerial satellite. Yeah. Just really super quick just to like, oh, he's there. He's, he exists. Um, it's just super, super passing though, but he's building and he tears down this house. Um, I'm wondering if I have two theories about what Vite's deal is. One, he's imprisoned on Mars in sort of a habitat or a snow globe that Dr. Manhattan has created and he's trying to escape. Like he's been there since, you know, the uh, (laughs) PDPedia, PDPedia, uh, says he's been missing since 2000. Last time he was publicly seen was 2007 in the reality of the show. And then I think 2012, they're like, oh, he's missing. And then he's presumed dead in 2017. And so he's there. But I have a crazier theory than that. So you think about, you think about, especially in this episode three, like this deal he has made with this game warden. And it's very sort of like formal. And it's like, hey, we agree yes. to these terms. So it's like, it's not just some random antagonist. It's like, so there was an agreement. There's something happened. This world he's living in is so dreamy and surreal. Mm. I am wondering if he did not, and I'm wondering if they weren't correct, he did change his, like he had some kind of crazy genetic surgery, changed his appearance, and essentially packed the part of his mind, the Adrian, the Ozymandias part of his mind away. Pardon me. He, he like suppressed that somewhere and he's actually living inside a new person essentially for a, a, a period of time. And 
what we're seeing is kind of the mindscape or the dream world that he built for himself to kind of house the Ozymandias personality until the right moment happened. I, that, that's a real big stretch. Yeah. Um, but it would be crazy if the person that he looks like in the real world is the male servant that he keeps killing over and over again in that play. Oh um, yeah. And his own little private prestige thing. It's fucking nuts. <clears throat> I love that by the way. I love that. I love that. It was very prestige esque and then it's just yeah. horrible, horribly wrong at the end. <laughs> but what is, what do you think they're celebrating? Like what is the, the cake they keep giving him? They're now on the third, the third iteration of that cake. Yeah, you're right. That's, that's definitely the groundhog day thing. And that jolly good fellow thing is crazy too. Um, I, the way I was thinking about it uh, was that this this person who was built up through the whole Watchmen mythology as the smartest man in the world is like he, he's broken down and he is no longer the smartest man in the world. And it's this portrayal of a, a man who's, you know, has previously had a lot of intelligence and ingenuity and he doesn't know what to do. And he's like <laughs> playing out this insane, like destructive Groundhog Day, as you call it, like that's perfect. Like he's, you know, it's like that that thing when he announces, like I've written a play in five acts, the, the son of the watchmaker, and I was like, oh, that'll be interesting. It's like some, and then you see the play, and it's like just the most busted performance of this thing. But <laughs> like, it's the, it's it's the origin so, story of Doctor Manhattan. Like he's, but it's so, oh yeah, yeah, but it's so low tech. Yeah, and it's like, man, the Adrian Veidt who had that freaking base on Antarctica or whatever would never put up with this. Like this is a madman. Like this is an Adrian Veidt who has lost his mind. So Which that's makes, where I, that's what I've been thinking of. But, but that whole I mean, Mars theory is crazy. I mean, Sorry. wouldn't it make sense? I mean, yes, I agree with all that. It, that is, that really accurately describes the state of mind, but wouldn't he be in, I mean, being imprisoned without all his technology and his toys, like it's almost right. like he's having to do with the exception of the tomatoes. That's the only thing I'm like, how did he do that? Yeah. But other than the tomatoes, it's almost like he's having to make do with kind of this like Victorian era tech, yeah. you know, and he's like put and even like when he was creating the um, the sort of the the suit um, for yeah. the his testing purposes, like he was creating these crazy elaborate schematics and everything, but he yeah. has to use the materials that yeah. are available to him. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, cobbling together all this stuff just to get this one thing. So he's still a genius, but he's a genius limited by the technology of whatever the reality is he's in. Um, I don't know. I just, I think that's going to be fascinating to, to see where that ends up. And the fact that they have to do this all, one thing we haven't really talked about, a lot of people watching the show are familiar with, Watchmen, but they don't know the story. They didn't read the book or they didn't watch the movie, but they're watching the show. So a lot of the show has to sort of work for a new audience too. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't have like Adrian Veidt be, you know, you can't have this, all this like meta, you know, like deep, you know, uh, Easter eggy kind of thing. It's got to sort of work on its own. So I'm curious where, and we're going to see Dr. Manhattan before the thing is over. Like surely he will appear at some point. So, how that all connects together in, in a, in a really, you know, necessary reveal, I think is going to be key. I have another theory about Dr. Manhattan. Okay. Well, I can think... I tie off on Adrian Veidt? Like yeah. I, um, well, and actually I, I, I don't think I need to tie off. I think, I think that's good where you left it. Perfect. And this will be, sh this will be quick. <laughs> I, I wonder if, if, um, some of the characters we're seeing aren't all, um, Dr. Manhattan trying to like basically, figure out if, if humanity's ready for him again. So right. the son of her dead partner, I think is Dr. Manhattan. I think the, Wait, sorry. Oh, 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 right, right, right. I think, you I think, think that's, oh, you know, he's I been think born again as this child sort not of thing. Born again. I think, I think he's just posing as this kid. Yes. Because they, kind of, they do talk about that, how he could just come to earth and like, look like one of them. Yeah. 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 I think that kid is it. I think, um, there's a couple other characters that have sort of popped up in, in interesting or unusual ways. I'm like, that's probably him. That's probably him. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Angela's husband is also him. I think oh. that, and I, if you, if you think about like how, you know, they're doing a lot of heavy lifting in terms of making the new, you know, the new generation of Watchmen very, very, um, analogous to the original characters. What would, and especially those, like, there was a really, kind of hot sex scene of, of sorts or love scene between Angela and her husband. And I'm just like, I just had these glimpses of Lori and Dr. Manhattan mm -hmm. where I'm just like, man, what if this guy that she sort of loves and is like, you know, really familiar with, and he has, if you watch him in episode one or two, um, he, 
he the way that actor's playing him is very sort of not aloof, but it's very, very much like John Osterman. It's very yeah. sort of like there's kind of a quality to him where I'm like, maybe he's Dr. Manhattan too. I just don't be surprised if like that suddenly if if in the big reveal it's like it's like, you know, Angela and he she turns around and all of a sudden he's blue. It's like, oh my God, mm. there we go. Anyway. Speaking of blue things, I laughed so hard when Laurie Blake pulled out the biggest blue dildo yes. I've ever seen and like attached like a testicle battery pack to it. It was yeah. that caught me so <laughs> off guard. Like yeah. and and not just the like sort of like hilarious like raw nature of it but the fact that it was like in that briefcase that we all suspect is like carrying something important well, like i thought it was a nuclear yeah, yeah. Briefcase. yeah i thought it was like a portable communication device that she could call mars with or something like that and then she yeah. opens it up and you see this blue glow and i was like i knew it and then <laughs> and of course at first you don't know that the the first part of it is a dildo exactly until yeah, she attaches yeah. the second part Oh my gosh! Really- I know what I was gonna say about uh, Adrian Veidt was um, it, it, to tie off on him was that the clones are the only thing that seem like I, I really like your theory though about like he's limited with the materials that he has, um, and obviously we'll we'll learn more or just continue to be crazy confused about these clones. Like so, I mean, but that how is he making clones? <laughs> I or guess is he making them? Are they just popping up? Are they just sort of like I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't remember how the movie handled it, but I I'm pretty sure in the book it was like really obvious that he created that cat that he had that Lynx. Yeah, he did. Like it was like a I I I know on uh, Wikipedia they called it like genetically something like like as though it, this were once a Lynx that he mutated. And I'm like, no, I think it's pretty clear in the book that like he just invented this weird alien thing. Yeah, yeah. And there's so, a really fun scene, by the way, in the Before Watchmen Ozymandias uh, book, um, which is great. We review it on a previous episode of Panelism. Um, there's a really fun sort of like they show you how it happened. And it's sort of adorable. You're like, oh, and it just becomes his friend. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, I... <laughs> We have touched on so many things and uh, and we've also ended in a spot where I'm like, oh, my gosh, I got to go back and watch this. And, like, see yeah. All this weird yeah. Stuff again. Yeah. This is going to be one of those ones. I can't wait to talk about this. Uh, hopefully weekly. You know, we'll try to do this once a week as episodes come yeah. out. And um, I think there will be the deeper we go into the rabbit hole. There's going to be 10 over. Sorry, nine. nine. overall. Yeah. Um, and you can see uh, they've already released the episode titles for the next uh, the next six so it's it's going to be – it ends December some, – somewhere mid-December. So it's going to be over pretty quick, but now, um, it'll be fun to keep going and, and just see where this ends up. Hopefully, 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 especially because the last – it's yeah. almost like he knows. The last episode is titled See How They Fly. And I'm just like, you just – you know you, – when we talk about sticking the landing, <laughs> you know, just – it's yeah. – I don't know. It just, I, I, I hope he does for all our sakes. I, uh, yeah, I would say one, one thing to note, and I'm curious how you, how you've been approaching this. I have not been watching the next time on Watchmen thing when oh. Game of Thrones did that. I, I consumed that like a, you know, ravenous beast, but like, I'm intentionally like, I don't want to know. Let me go in as cold as possible. I'm so glad this is coming out weekly and it's not available for me to binge. Yeah, because it's too heavy otherwise. I, I have to think about it a little bit more, you know? Um, and yeah, it's a good series to do that on. Now, whether it has to stretch out for that long, like, or if it could just come out every three days. <laughs> yeah. That's, an, that's another whole. I don't mind a week. I don't, idea, I've, I've but, got too much to do. I've, I, I need yeah. time in between, especially now that they're doing dark materials like you know, every Monday, apparently. God. Oh, has it started? It Is starts what, tonight while oh, we're talking. It's, go, it's airing. So yeah, I'm going to go home and watch it with my wife could be great oh wow okay no i'm excited about that that's amazing wow um yeah. anyway we should wrap this up let's do a, it put a pin in this uh tie it off um whatever spank the baby uh where can people <laughs> find us uh that is not a, a podcast <laughs> uh well we have an instagram account panelism.ink and you can also find uh us at panelism.ink in your web browser that's all our past episodes and we're going to do a, a bit of an overhaul to that and include some uh, book club stuff and some other things. So keep an eye on that. More to come. And keep 
keep subscribing. Tell your friends. We've got, like I said in the beginning, we've got a lot of cool stuff coming. We're going to be doing more watching episodes, one shots, book club, interviews. Uh, if you're a panelism fan, it's about to get better uh, as we as we go into the re- remainder of 2019. I can't yeah. talk anymore. We're starting that, that we're going to have our, our cruise next year. That's fanalism, right. Panelism, panelism, colon, fanalism. Um, yeah, it's just us and Jonathan Colton sailing the seas, uh, you know, south of Bermuda, slightly. Or not Bermuda, Bahamas. I don't know. Um, like yeah, Captain basically Marvel. our fire fest, but, uh, yeah. We should do a fire fest. Just like promise. It's so a easy. Just promise a bunch of stuff and then just not even show up. You don't need to do any. You too can have a hit documentary. Actually, two documentaries that are, uh, you know. God, fire. Wow. What a great.